नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुद्ध The subject of the discourse today is what exactly is life, and what is the world in which life exists? What are the relationships between the world and the life where we exist? Now, this is a question. it has come down from times immemorial since the very existence of human existence uh, by human life that people have been uh, speculating about the nature of life what is life why the life is there what exactly are the contents of life and how the how life has originated and how it ceases or how does it Uh, keep continuing along with the world so the life world and the continuity of both these are very profound philosophical and legitimate questions but then the answers are not very simple now it is because people speculate about life and not see life as it really is yathabhuta yeah, jnana darshana said lord buddha see things as they are and don't be carried away by the appearances appearances of life or as life appears to be no go into what life is and not be carried away by how it appears to be so the a uh, conflict that we have about life born of all kinds of speculative views speculative theories and uh, religious views religious theories secular views secular theories all kinds of these kind of speculative uh, theories and views keep on coming from uh, age to age and all the conflicts that arise because of that but if we undertake investigation of life in a very simple yet very profound and straight forward manner then after all we don't need to speculate about life we don't need to speculate about the various appearances around life the world and so on all we need to know is what is the ultimate content of life so in a sutta bhagwan buddha gave the eight qualities of maha the great ocean there he said maha samudrasa ekameva rasam yadidam lo na rasam he said he was addressing to the monks He said, "Monks, look, the great ocean has just one taste, and that is the taste of salt. So, the investigation of reality, which means dhamma. So, dhamma has only one taste, the taste of liberation." taste of freedom freedom from speculation about things freedom from greed freedom from ignorance freedom from delusion about things and so our freedom from greed hatred and delusion now that is the that is just the one and only taste of dhamma so as a practitioner of dhamma seeking enlightenment meaning seeking the ultimate reality about life its origin its cessation 
and the path leading to the cessation. So now, if we inquire in an open-minded and in a straightforward manner, just investigating the content of life, we will see that there is no need for speculation of any kind, subjective uh, creation of views and theories and all that. No. Just broad, objective inquiry about life will reveal that life ultimately boils down to just one word. And that one word is action. So life ultimately boils down to action. So how action arises, why action arises, those are legitimate uh, inquiries, but they are not views. <coughs> One need not speculate how life, how action arises and all that. All that, a, you see, sincere inquirer of truth, a sincere, uh, you see, investigator of reality. All that he or she needs to do is just take one day. As Lord Buddha said, the ocean has one taste, salt. So know that taste, one taste, you don't need to dig up the entire ocean. You don't need to travel all over the ocean and try to find out what is that one taste and all that. No. Just one drop of ocean water from any corner, from any place, anywhere, from that infinite expanse of water, just take one drop and you get its ultimate content, the sodium, the so the salty taste of the ocean. Similarly, just live one day of life. After all, life is what? Day after day, day after day, day after day. It boils down to that. So all you need to do is just investigate one day of your existence. Life is existence. There is life because we exist. And we exist because there is life. So now this existence called life, just one day of this existence, if you investigate in an open, very, you see, objective way, open-minded way, without any subjective uh, speculation whatsoever, then you find that this one day can be ultimately, you see, boiled down to action. And the action here, just threefold action, not more than three, not less than three. And what are these three action, types of actions that constitute the ultimate content of life? Either we are doing something from the time we wake up in the morning till we retire throughout our waking hours and even in sleep we are doing something. Now, so this action can boils down to bodily action. We do something, verbal action, we say something, and mental action, we think, we imagine, we speculate. All kinds of mental activities of that nature. That's all that life is. So if we investigate, if you want to know life, Know your action and you know your life. If you want to know the ocean, know just one drop and you know the whole ocean. So if you want to know your life, what life is, and get the best out of life, because life is a great mind of wisdom, of power, of virtue, of goodness, and also of evil. 
So if you want to know the, poten the potentials of life, what you can get out of it, in order to make life meaningful, happy, peaceful, then start with knowing your action. You don't need to go and go to this laboratory, that laboratory, this scientist, that side. No. Play in yourself. Just watch, observe all that you do, all that you say, all that you think. Play in observation. Just watch. This requires mindfulness, attentiveness. So when you undertake this great mission of knowing life, start with the very first thing in life as you get up. What do you do? When you get up, either you say something or you just go out, you have your wash, you do this. One after the other, inquire. Every action that you have done. So you make a list of whatever you have done, whatever you have said, whatever you have thought. You will be surprised to know that how much you did not know yourself and how much now has been revealed by this simple watching and mindfulness of every action that you have engaged yourself in. It's as simple as that, but not as easy as that, no. It's simple to say, but not easy to do. But that is where it has value, that is where it has got power. A simple, uh, easy thing has very little value. A difficult thing has lot of value. So now, if you start your day with being mindful, so well, I have, I get up, the moment I open my eyes and I am see, awake, from that moment start your investigation, observing what you do mentally. You think, you imagine, or you are rushing, or you say, oh, I have got to do this, I have got to do that, all kinds of things come in. So all those observe, and the net result you will see at the end of the day is that your action reveals what you are. First of all, what you are in terms of, let us say, psychological characterology, that is your temperament. You will see, during the whole day that you spent inquiring about yourself, trying to find out, to gain the knowledge of yourself in its true nature or color, then you will see that, you see, you have never known yourself at all. Just by my being mindful, just by being, uh, you see, open-minded inquirer of every action, you see what a wonderful truth is revealed about yourself. You'll see that your actions are either motivated by something or they are not motivated. Or they are either intentionally done or not intentionally, just mechanically done. Or you will see some of the action that brings you regret, that you, you think, oh, I wish I had not done that. Or you don't have any regret whatsoever, any sense of guilt, that this is not a good thing to do. What I have done, I should not have done. Or it's very good I have done, I should have done more. I should do more. This kind of dichotomous understanding, the nature of every action uh, begins to reveal, means to, uh, you see, unfold. 
So you see that action is not a very simple affair. Though it is the ultimate nature of life, but it's not a very simple thing, it's a very complex thing. First of all, now the, the nearest and the, uh, the you see, the, an example that one can, um, one can illustrate is by means of a tree. Let us say there are, this earth is filled with trees. There are trees which are medicinal, there are trees which are, are plant life which are not non-medicinal. Some are poisonous, some are non-poisonous. Some are very beneficially, uh, beneficial to human uh, beings, some are not. Some are edible, some are not edible. And so on, you can get so many different types of plant life. Now, the plant life, basically what it is. Now you'll see that a tree, <coughs> you know, there are different parts of the world where you have trees which are as tall as 200 feet or even more. These redwood trees in America, my goodness, is a huge, huge stuff. Huge thing, 200, 300 feet high. And then you investigate further how it stands in spite of all the gale and the hurricane and all the wind power, 100 miles, 200, 150 miles wind power, the tree stands still. It stands undisturbed at all. It moves with the wind. That's okay. But it doesn't get uprooted. It's just there. And from the last maybe 100 years, now you investigate, you'll find that the root system has gone down as deep as the, uh, the, 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 the tree. The, the taller the tree, deeper the root system. And not only that, a, a tree, a tall tree of 200 feet, let us say, will have, uh, you see, a girth, a huge girth, and then it will be broad. The branches will go in all directions maybe 100 feet diameter from one end to another, that breadth. So again, you investigate down, you will see that the tree, the root system is nothing but a network. It has uh, grown into a network of uh, roots, all kind of roots in all directions, as wide, as broad, as the tree is above. So what is above is reflected by what is below. So now these actions can be compared more or less in that way. Now, every action has a very deep root and these roots define the nature of the action in the sense that these roots make the action either good or bad. Good and bad belongs to what is called the realm of ethics and morality. Normally in the world, morality and ethics, they derive their authority from religion, from uh, supposedly, say, some supernormal uh, religious authority, a god or some such thing, or a prophet, or a scripture and all that sort of thing. That is the, the <coughs> ultimate or authority that says a, an action to be good or bad. Not so in the teachings of the Buddha. And an action is good or bad, is moral or not moral, on the, uh, depends upon what kind of root, what kind of, uh, you see, motivations are behind the action. Any action which is rooted in greed, hatred and delusion or ignorance is unwholesome, unskillful, negative, bad. That is bad. That is the defining definition of bad. 
In other words, the psychological roots of an action defines the nature of action. It is not a scripture, not a guru, not a god, none of this. Not any theory. Human beings create these theories and all based upon ignorance and not knowing. Because they don't know, they keep on concocting all kinds of theories. And the mind is ever ready to do that. Because it doesn't cost mind much. It is all based upon ignorance, based upon delusion. You keep on imagining, speculating and you create. So now, for an investigator of reality and truth, that is what a Buddhist is. A Buddhist is not just a practitioner of religion or any system, moral system or spirituality or what. Just plain inquirer and liver of reality. That's what. Enlightenment means realization of reality. As soon as you realize the ultimate reality of life, there your mind gets transformed into a super mundane, trans mundane reality. And then you become, you know everything about life, the origin of life and how to transcend life into the dimension of freedom, enlightenment, Nibbana. So, this objective approach that characterizes everything in Buddhism. So, morality has to be judged in terms of the root, root causes of actions. So, here you have two kinds of actions then, good and bad, according to the law of morality, not according to anybody else. Law of morality says whatever a thing is good because it is beneficial, because it is positive, because it is rooted in non-ignorance, which means wisdom. It is rooted in knowledge, <coughs> intuitive wisdom. It is based upon non-greed, but charity, generosity, compassion, love, all these higher virtues. That is why it is good. It is based on non-hatred, love. You see, universal love, universal compassion, and so on. So these are the high, the high virtues, noble virtues, and the wisdom, and so on. Whatever action is rooted in them, alobha, adosa, amoha. Any action which is rooted in non-greed, alobha, it doesn't mean merely absence of greed, no. It means something that can do away with greed. Now charity or dana or giving is the opposite of grabbing and getting. Greed manifests in the form of getting and grabbing and accumulating and wanting, longing. So now the opposite of that is giving, giving up or giving as dana or generosity, charity, sharing. That's the opposite. So now anything, non-greed therefore, is not absence of greed, but is the presence of a positive factor that does away with greed. <coughs> Similarly, non-hatred is not just absence of hate, but the presence of universal love, loving kindness, friendliness, a generous approach, a friendly <coughs> approach to everything, <coughs> goodwill. These are the factors that are the very opposite of hate anger and so on. So any fact, any action which is rooted in this wholesome, uh, these psychological factors 
which are positive, morally uh, uplifting and beneficial. So such actions are good and therefore productive of happiness. So now you have, now as you keep on inquiring, you see, so the action is not a very simple affair. First of all, the action must, action is bound to be either intentional or non-intentional. That means it is based upon volition or will. You intend to do something, you intend to say something, you intend to think something, and the result, the outcome is action. Now this intentional action is a very powerful action, it has a potency because it motivates, you see, a person into acting in a certain way. So intentional action is a very powerful action, it has a potency and it can, the potency is in the form of giving result. So every action, just like a tree, not only has a root, but it has fruit. It produces results. It not only has root, but it has also fruits. So it bears fruit. Every action therefore bears a result. And the result, type of result it bears depends upon the motivation the intention behind, as well as the root, the, 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 the hetu, the root cause, the roots of an action, either greed, hatred and so on. Intention plus roots, these motive, motive forces. Now all these put together make an action. And that is why an action is very powerful. It is capable of producing happiness or misery. Now, this is again another way of looking at life. Life can be either happy or it can be unhappy. It can be suffering. Not only individually, but also collectively. Now, for instance, in human play, you can see there are human beings who are very happy who enjoy all kinds of successes, who enjoy power, position, success, and uh, everything that, uh, you see, all, everything that is good for life. And there are others who are unhappy, miserable. You see, for them, life is a failure, series of failures and trouble and worry and suffering of all kinds. So here and now you see in the human world you have got two distinct types of human existence. A very happy one or an unhappy one. And what creates their happiness and unhappiness? It's not the creation of a god or a human being or a guru or a religion, nothing of the sort. Action. The motive power behind action. So happiness and misery is the creation of action based on its motivations and intention. Once we understand this very clearly and we understand that whatever we are doing there is a kind of intention behind. Be careful of that intention. Be careful of the motive, motives like greed, hatred and delusion or non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. Just become aware. What motivates? Is it due to greed that you are going and trying to grab something? Or is it due to anger that you go and punch somebody? Or is it due to ignorance that you keep on creating theories and all kinds of fear and uh, uh, false beliefs and all that sort of thing? So now once you understand these roots, root causes of actions and the intentions behind, and you understand that they are productive of the basic drive in life, namely 
happiness or misery. Not only at the individual level, but also at the collective level. Human beings enjoy a lot of happiness, lot of power, lot of virtue, lot of goodness, lot of beneficial, beneficial things, unlike the animals, unlike beings who are born in a lower plane of existence, like the animal life, like the uh, ghosts and the spirit life, like the demoniac type of beings, like those who are uh, suffering immensely, unmitigated suffering in the plane, in the hellish worlds, in those worlds where known as hells. My goodness, suffering is unimaginable. And all these sufferings have been caused by action. A being of the hellish world suffers. Once I have told you this story, probably you will remember and I will mention it once again. Lord Buddha immediately, you see, after his enlightenment, and as he was sitting under the Bodhi tree and musing in the sheer bliss of emancipation, he saw a creature moving above, or this, floating in the air, crying absolutely very, very pitifully. And he had the body of a human being, the face of a, of a uh, pig and his body was burning fire from one end to the other and from tail, from the leg to head and from head to leg and again downwards from uh, face down right up to tail the, from the tummy both ways and sideways again and immensely immediately Buddha applied his supernormal power and he found out who the bee is to begin with, what kind of being it is and why it is in such pitiable suffering and crying, immense misery. And uh, then he found out that here is a person who was supposed to be a monk but lived a very wretched life teaching all kinds of stupid uh, uh, you know, uh, false religious beliefs and all that sort of thing. Making money, living, uh, enjoying all the sensual pleasures of household life and yet calling himself a renunciate. One who has renounced all the so-called worldly pleasures. And all the wrong ways that you can... He was a very, very intelligent person. An extreme... He was a master of all the three Vedas and everything. Very, very uh, uh, powerful man, the king's guru he was. So, anything, whatever you may consider to be good things of life, all that this fellow enjoyed and misused as a monk, as a renunciate. All the respect he got, he did not deserve. <coughs> but he went on enjoying nonetheless. The result, he was born in the Preta Loka with this very hideous look of a human body and the face of an of a animal, the pig, and suffering fire burning the body from end to end. And it was not a mere hallucination, no. It was a real experience. But Buddha did not tell this to anybody about it. Until many years later, many months rather, later, when one day Venerable Moggallana and Venerable Lakhana, both arhats, very powerful arhats, liberated enlightened disciples, until one day, you see, they were staying in Rajagaha in the mountain Ginjakuta, the uh, <coughs> Gijakuta mountain and in one of those caves they were staying there. The vultures speak it is called Gijakuta. 
So, now, as they were coming down on their way for arms round in the morning, Venerable Mogulana saw the same being again, flying and crying and, uh, you see, beseeching from Venerable Mogulana, saying, Bhante, please help, please help. And so, he was so full of compassion. He had a uh, compassionate, a dukkha face, uh, you see, riddled with suffering and pain, and with, but a kind of smile. You see, painful smile, the smile of pain. So, whenever Mahabha, uh, Lakhana saw that, and he says, Brother, what makes you smile like this? What makes you feel this tremendous pain and all that? He says, Brother, please don't ask me. You ask me this question in the evening in the presence of the Lord. If he, if he allows, then I will drill it. So it happened in the evening. Every day they used to go to hear the Dhamma in the uh, Veluvana monastery where the Buddha was staying. And uh, there, Venerable uh, Lakhana raised the question, says, Bhagavan, I saw Brother Mogulana smiling like that, and his face was filled with pain. And so, but he won't reveal, he won't tell. Because monks are not allowed to reveal their supernormal experiences and abilities. Buddhist monks cannot demonstrate, cannot show off their so-called psychic powers and abilities. They are forbidden to do that. So Venerable Mughalana, when he said that, Lakhana Bhante also understood. So Buddha said, well, Mughalana, will you please explain what made you feel so painful and then this? He explained the same thing, the same. He described exactly what the Buddha had seen also. So Bhagavan said, yes, my dear, I had... The same experience on the very day I became enlightened. But I did not reveal. I was waiting for the appropriate occasion where I could corroborate with somebody. So now it has happened. So there is so much to know in this world that we don't know. What we don't know is so immense and vast indeed. And what we know is so little indeed. So we have reason to be humble. So a, a fact finder of reality, that is what a Buddhist is, fact finder. Find out facts of reality. We have to be humble. We have to approach in a very humble, objective way, which will be both, you know, uh, rational and also moral and also philosophically true. So that way, so there is so much now, just this inquiry about one action, so much of uh, information will come out just from one day's experiment in finding out who I am, what is so-called me, what is this like, what, it, what does it boils down to ultimately action. Now this inquiry about action reveals a whole world of information and also guidance to make our life meaningful, have more control over our actions, have more power to be mindful about our actions and be the master of action because ultimately Happiness and misery of life depends upon action. And not only that, our destiny, action creates the law of cause and effect. That is what I am going to discuss about next, in the next, in, in this series on action. I will discuss from where has this law of cause and effect come about, originated. What is this law of action and reaction? or law of action, cause and effect. So this is going to be the subject of the discourse next 
uh, next time and uh, uh, there it will reveal again the, the, you see, the wonderful nature of action, the mystery of action, what action can do. And once we understand our actions in this manner, very clear-cut manner, we become the master of our action. That is the goal of Buddhist life. Become the master of your action. With this I conclude, may the grace of Bhagavan Buddha surround your lives with wisdom and well-being. May you all be happy.